So, you know? he's crying, Ralph Khan, Ken Yapsi cried. Okay. Because he have money. So, let's get started. Okay. <laughs> Jewish guilt. We love Jewish guilt. So, last week we spoke about thought, speech, and action. We spoke about the four worlds, the worlds of Atzilut, of Bria, Yetzira, and Asiya. Now, now, thought, speech, and action are called the garments of the soul. Now, today, we're going to discuss how this kind of all fits together and what we're going to call the beautification of the thought, speech, and action. So now, let's talk about individuals. We speak about the Bainini. Who's the Bainini? The Bainini is called the average person. The average person isn't able to convert intellect or feelings to be totally good and excellent. That's the job of the righteous person, the person that we call the tzaddik. The tzaddik, the righteous person, is completely free from sin. Now, most ordinary people are tempted to commit sins and to transgress God's will. So therefore, we call the average person is tested daily. And the most they're going to accomplish is not to allow their urges and not to allow their emotions to carry them away. Now, by refraining from transgressing God's will, they become what we call in Kabbalah, Beinonim, which means they have maximized their human potential and they have the ability to restrain themselves. Which means it's, they're still getting bothered, they're still getting tempted, but they have the ability to overpower their emotions and to restrain themselves. When people do this, they are actually, in these terms, beautifying their thought, their speech, and their action. They do this by thinking proper thoughts, by speaking words of kindness, by speaking words that are intellectually appropriate, and by acting in a proper way, in a nice way. So the Bainini, the intermediate, the, 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 the average person, is what we're trying to strive for. We're not trying to strive to be a perfect person. Human beings are flawed. We live in a world of which we have to know that we're flawed people. So our goal is not to try to be a perfect person. It's not like one day I'm gonna become perfect. That's not the point of this. The righteous level is beyond our ability. It's beyond the scope of reality. Unless you're born righteous, there's no reason why you should try or strive to become righteous. But to be an average person, now average, <laughs> it's funny because we call it average, but average is well above average, I think, I think in our society. But Kabbalah believes that every single individual has the ability to attain the level of what we call average. You don't have to have a special soul. You don't have to be born with a predisposition to average. What is average again? What do we say average is? What does that mean? It means that you have, like you want, you have thoughts about sinning, but you don't like- The uh, person has the ability to refrain. Mm -hmm. They have thoughts. They even have, it, it, it bothers them but they have the ability to control their emotions and to refrain from doing something wrong. From thinking something wrong would be the highest level, but at least doing and speaking, and then eventually thinking something wrong. There, there's something uh, incomplete in this uh, idea of Benjamin. Okay. You, especially when you, uh, when you compare it to the analysis of the Sefiro that we just did, which implies a lot more uh, creative input of the individual. So this is what I'm gonna get to. And I'm just refraining from doing the same. Right, so I'm gonna to get to this right now. This is exactly where I'm going. Now, I mean, I mean that, that like when, when you look at the Sefirot, okay, and, and you look at the way that you're supposed to blend all these different faculties 
into you know tiferet and dat. Uh, it, it implies a much more active, creative role for the individual than just the role of being tempted by sin and referring to yourself. What, you know what, what Fred is saying is that we're fluid people. And, and what it looks like at first glance, without understanding the basis of it, is that this is a linear idea. This is not a linear idea, this is fluid, and watch how this works. So the reason why Kabbalah emphasizes the importance of refining the garments, right? The, the garments referring to the thought, the speech, and the action, is in other, let's say, other forms of Jewish thought, there is a great emphasis on essence. But Kabbalah uses a different approach. Kabbalah says, make the focus the divine garments, the garments of thought, speech, and action, and they are going to help the person grow and become closer to God. As far as the essence is concerned, humans really don't know what's going on. And besides, it shouldn't concern the human mind because a person has been born and that's the, and, and, and that's the way it is, and that's God's issue. So, there's a, a beautiful story mentioned in the Talmud, a story of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Prior to his passing, he said the following. He said, I don't know in which path I'm going to. He was referring to the afterlife, obviously. He was going to paradise, or was he going to the opposite of paradise, purgatory? The question asked by many commentators is how could Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, this great Talmudist, this great tzaddik, this righteous man, how could he not know? What, what, what is he, joking? He was a person who never sinned. He was a person who was completely righteous. He would be fooling himself and be out of line to even think that is a possibility that in the afterlife he's going to be punished. Kabbalah gives the following response. Rabbi Yochanan thought his lifetime was so busy and occupied in fulfilling his mission as a Jew that he felt that it would be a pure waste of time to think about his personal status. Not only that, but it would be considered a sin to think about his situation because thinking about himself would be like wasting precious time. And he needed that time to be able to serve God and, 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 and accomplish. And he didn't need that time to focus on himself. So when it came the day of his passing, all of a sudden he had a question. He had a Torah obligation to make an account of his entire lifetime. So this was the first time in his entire life that he actually stopped to think about himself. So, of course, he didn't know because he never thought about it. Now, this is not a fable. This is a real episode. And I believe that this episode has a profound lesson for us, for what we call the average person or the person that we're striving to be. When people spend time and energy focusing on themselves, Are you it? Yeah. Okay. thinking about their good qualities, thinking about their shortcomings, they have questions like, why do I have a certain type of mind? Why, did God, why didn't God create me with a nicer character? Maybe I should be, maybe God should have given me a, a, a more pleasant disposition. This is an absolute waste of time because the person who's gonna think these things is an, arro is an arrogant person. Because what should we be thinking about? How do I become better? How do we, how do I, not how do, why did, why God didn't you create me this way? How do I become a better person? It's now in my hands. Mm -hmm. It's actually, I would say, the exact perfect example of what it means to become an adult. The point where we stop blaming our parents for all of our problems and we start blaming ourselves. I would say that's an adult perspective. And I think a lot of people never come to that adult perspective. They, they remain children out of choice. Yeah, but isn't that the same as like 
like asking himself if he's, if he's going to heaven or, or, or hell or whatever. Well, says, like that's the same thing. You're like, oh, what am I doing right now? Like, uh, am I being a good person? Okay, no, I'm probably not. I should probably work. But this. imagine if he, imagine if we stopped focusing ourselves and started focusing on a higher power on God. God wants us to refine and improve our ways of thinking, not just our ways of action, not just our ways of speech, but actually God wants us to improve the way we think. Now that's insane. I never stop thinking to the point where even in my passive thought, my dreams, which my dreams sometimes are, are, are incredible and sometimes preposterous, sometimes I remember them, sometimes I don't or I'm not getting into dreams today. But what you're doing is you're asking me to change my thinking? Why? Why is it so important? Why do I have to change my thinking? It's the closest to you, huh? Because according to Kabbalah, thought creates. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do anything without having the thought. You have to have the thought. Exactly. You have, the of the, of the thought you have to have the thought before you do anything. And that thought is the closest thing that we have to the actual creative process. And because it's so close to the creative process, we have to be so careful to, to, to hone it. We need that. What we're saying is that it is our responsibility over the course of our lifetime to hone our thoughts. Also hone our actions and also hone our speech. But I think a lot of people <clears throat> wouldn't think of honing thoughts. What thoughts? What does it matter what I'm thinking? Our Buddhism is a lot of that, no? I think, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know about they, call it, like, they call the mind like the crazy monkey. And you need to, you need to it's a tool. Like your brain's a tool and you need to learn to use it. It's not just like uh, run the show, you know, yeah. think about everything. Yeah. But, and, and, I'm, and I'm not belittling the fact that, look, refining our actions, refining our speech are also a big deal. And it's important. But I think that most people don't think of refining thoughts. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to refine my thoughts? Mm -hmm. well, my, my thoughts, they're between me and myself. No one will ever know my thoughts. It depends, there's different types of thoughts. Right? There are thoughts that are directed towards a very specific goal, okay? So for that, we, it, it's easier to see why you should refine your thoughts, right? If you're trying to solve a, a technical problem and you're just like, you can't focus your thoughts, right. you're just all over the place, you're, you're not going to be able to, to solve, to solve okay, the problem. Okay, fine. So then you, you, say that, to so you say the person has a little bit of attention deficit and do something to yeah. fix your attention deficit. But I'm, I'm, I'm not even saying to that level. I'm not even sorry, you know, and it's so funny how I'm just, I just fed in to the, the, commercialized, the commercialization of thought where I say, well, it's not my problem anymore. I, this is my label, you know? It's amazing, there's a label for everything now. And a lot of those labels are thought related. Of course, but my point is that, is that there's, there's undirected thought, which is just, I think what I think, whatever. That's just spontaneous thought. But as soon as I uh, posit a goal or an intention, if my goal or my intention is to get closer to God or to become a better person or to become uh, just richer and like, I don't really care about other people, whatever it is, right? Um, I'm gonna have to direct my thoughts and my thinking towards that goal in order to get, to, to get closer to it. So you're saying, there's no, there's you're no saying on, on a self-refinement level, which means what you're saying is that it's the thought that is going to have to be directed in order for that to happen. I'm saying that even more than that, let's say, let's say you're not such a, a, an astute person. Let's say you don't have your life figured out. Let's say you don't have the ability to direct your thoughts or to say like, you know, today I'm gonna do my uh, aphorism or, and I'm gonna say, you know, today is gonna be a great day and I'm gonna conquer the day and it's gonna be amazing and it's gonna be, you know, and I'm gonna convince myself and I'm gonna totally, every time I have a negative thought, I'm gonna get rid of that negative thought and I'm gonna replace it with a positive thought. What I'm saying is that that's a wonderful thing and that's great, but what if you don't have your life figured out? What if you can't wake up in the morning and like, you know, what we were talking about, like the previous Rebbe says, wake up like a lion, or you know, how do you wake up like a lion? You go to sleep like a lion, right? So you, you know, or, or how do you, otherwise if you go to sleep like a horse, you wake up like a horse. 
let's say you don't have your life figured out. What do you do? What is the average person? How do you start this process of refining thought? The first step is just start by realizing that your thought is not just yours. Your thought is not just the closest thing to you and no one will ever know. Your thought is the first step in you or, and, and the closest thing that you have to the creative process. If you want to understand creative, which means what is creation? Creation is yesh ma'ayin, something from nothing. If, what do we even know? Like someone says, oh, I, I, I made this table. No, you didn't make this table. You took something and you refashioned it and now it's a table. You took something and you refashioned it and now it's a chair. What I'm saying is the creative process is something from nothing. The closest thing that we have of something from nothing is thought. And so therefore it is much more of a responsibility of ours to hone and to process and to try to, to really work through our thoughts in order for us to be able to start the true creative process. You want to be creative? Focus on your thought. And, and what happens? But then my thought never, how do I do it? I have a lot of thoughts. I mean, even right now, I mean, Rabbi, you said some very nice things, but you know what? My mind was wandering already. Oh, you said something and it triggered another thought and all of a sudden I'm off into the other and I have no idea what you said. Can you say that again? Because I, I, I couldn't, I didn't remember what you said because my mind was wandering. Why? Because I don't have control of my thoughts. So we think the creative process is, oh my gosh, I went to this class and the rabbi was talking and it got me thinking about something else. Already, right now, you're already like thinking about something else. Or you're thinking about the next thing you're gonna say. Or you're thinking about how to respond to it. Or you're thinking if, if, if it connects with my collective memory and the things that I know before. Or you're thinking, does it fit and jive with everything else that I know? What if we just stopped and truly had the ability to take a step back and say, I don't know what the result is. This is not a pointed question. I'm, I'm not leading this conversation anywhere. It's open, we're allowed to be open, but we're also allowed to accept new ideas on their own level, on, on the face value. That's the power of thought. What, right away, we have this natural mechanism that's within us, and that mechanism says, I cannot accept what you're saying because it doesn't jive, it doesn't fit with what I know before. Now, now, what is it that you know before? And how do you know what you know before? You know it because you listened to someone else say something and it made sense to you, or it didn't make sense to you, or it was at a point before you can really properly think and it was someone who, who was part of your impressionable time in your life when you were a child who kind of created your sense of understanding. And as your mind develops, it developed into this way, which is basically what's happening and what happens to most people. But how do you allow yourself to think something different? If you're constantly thinking about, how am I gonna to respond to this? How am I going to, 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 to we, answer this? We have no choice, we have no choice. If we wanna to relate to anything, to any piece of information, to any object, to any uh, event, we have no choice. We always have a choice. I, I, I know, but, but I didn't finish. The second part of the sentence is, we have no choice but to elaborate a thought about it first, before, um, before speech comes into, into, into play, right? Even if it's a microsecond, there's gonna be thought, right? So going back to, to, to what, what, what we're seeing here about um, if you wanna become a better person or if you wanna become closer to God, you don't focus on your essence, you focus on the garments, you focus right. on the thought, speech, and action. That's right. In, in that sense, what, 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 what uh, I think what's intended is the following. It's that, you know, it's one thing, regulating your speech is something that is easy, right? You can have a rule. You can have like an external rule that says, don't say this, don't say that, don't use that word, don't say bad things about God, whatever. You can have a rule and it's, you regulate your speech, right? Regulate your action in a way. It's also very easy. So just do this or do that, or don't do this, don't do that. Regulating your thought is something that's a lot harder. Why? Because my thoughts are gonna go, they're much more undisciplined, because they're in that pure potentiality of creation and they're inside my head and nobody's judging me, nobody knows what I'm thinking. 
I can pick whatever I want, right? right? But now the message here is that if you wanna become a better person over the course of your life, if you wanna get closer to God, if you wanna go down that path, um, you're gonna have to work on your thoughts. Now, what does that mean? By not thinking for, like when you're doing yeah. something, is that what you're saying? Like when, if you're doing something, then you, you're, it's called like being in front of the moment. Yeah. And, it, and, and you know when you do meditation and the thought keeps coming in your head and what you have to do, you have to keep coming back to the present moment. Yeah. And I think that's what also meditation does. Is you train your brain to all the time when a thought comes, you're just like, okay, I'm having a thought, I'm going to come back to this moment right now. Yeah. And but, that but, training... But, but, but you know that process of, of sort of like uh, directing yourself towards something, okay? It, 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 the only way that there's a true bonding with you deeply as a person is if you can change your thinking, the patterns of your thinking. Right? So if you're in, in, in situation X, okay, and something happens, you know, like, like I am not gonna, gonna impulsively get angry at people, okay? I'm not gonna do it, I have that rule, like I'm not gonna say that or whatever. And then it happens. And then it happens. It just happens. You exactly. Know? You, can't, you can't control it, it just happens. Exactly. And you can yell out at the people. Right? Okay, so, so, let's, so level, let's use that, but let's use that as a metaphor. You still have work to do on your thoughts. But let's use that as a metaphor. <laughs> so you say, I'm not going to get yeah. angry. I'm not yeah. going to get angry. And you, you meditate and you do whatever you yeah. need to do in order to not get angry. And then that moment comes and someone pushes your buttons the wrong way and you get angry. Cool. What, is, what is it? But what if I just told you, you want to become a better person? I'm not telling you don't get angry. I'm telling you take control of your thought, your speech, and your action. Take control of it. That is the secret. That is the secret sauce to becoming a better person. By you honing, taking control, saying that my, it's obvious. If you do something, actions are the most obvious to us. We are whatever we do. And, and not only that, as a Jewish value, we value action more than anything. And we've spoken about this so many times. But that is the reality. We value action more than anything. Now, speech, talk is cheap. I can talk this, I can talk that. Politicians are talking every single day. But look, it's so interesting. You know, you see all these things that are going on in the world today and all these different you know, cases that are happening with politicians and they're going back to something they said. Now, what if we were able to take control of those actions? And it wasn't just like, I'm gonna say whatever I want, however I want, in whatever way I want. Now, someone's gonna to say to me, come on, I wanna be free. Mm -hmm. why, are you, why are you putting so many obstacles in the path of my freedom? You can't be free unless you're in control. Because you're situating yourself inside the individual, right? Because yes. usually the language of freedom the language of freedom is some of the most problematic language because freedom, when it operates at the level of the state, right? It's like, I don't want the government to force me to do this or to do this or, to, or not to say this or not to I'll say that. I'll tell you the basic issue with freedom. It's based on rights. Mm -hmm. We don't care about rights in Judaism. Actually, there are no rights in Judaism, only responsibilities. Yeah. And if you change all of the rights into responsibilities, think about it, it's my right to what? Say whatever I want. It's my right to say whatever I want. What if I change that? What if I say that? What if I change that to it's my responsibility to say whatever I want? What does that do to it? It puts it back on me. Yeah. The right puts it on the, the government. The right puts it on someone else. The responsibility puts it back. It is my responsibility to control my words. The, the only reason that, 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 that the, 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 the language of rights was, I, I know this whole thing, rights and duties, uh, the only reason the language of rights was, was necessary historically is because who do human rights apply to? They apply to governments. Because governments are the ones that violated the freedom of expression, freedom of association, uh, the basic... But what if we said to the governments... What if we said government. to the governments, it's not your... We, you, we don't have rights. There's no bill of rights. There's a bill of responsibilities that the government has towards the people. Yeah, but sure. The net effect would be the same. You know, I don't know the, if it would be the same. The I don't know if it would be the same. Well, for the person vis-a-vis -vis the government. I think that politicians don't see the responsibilities they have towards the people. Yeah, of course. But let's say, let's say the government made a law saying that um, 
I don't know. Like you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to. I'm just giving an example. You're not allowed to talk about religion anymore in, in, in a blog or in an article. Like something like that. Okay. Clearly violates free speech. Right. Okay? The net effect of you have the responsibility or the right is that individuals can petition the state to invalidate that law. Yeah, but right? I think That's I think the it's there's a huge difference between the right of free speech and the responsibility of free speech. It's huge. Th- th- there's yeah, course, two totally different implications yeah, to the right of free speech and the responsibility. Right, when it's only a right, you have no responsibility at all towards society. It's like you can say whatever you want. It could be there, there's there's uh, right after you express yourself. There's no more control. There's no more direction towards anything that's... And even that's not totally true. Even we that's not totally true. we also live in a society where people have a certain sense of, this is coming to me. This is... This is mine. I mean, I, I mean it's, you know, it's my right to this and it's my right to that. Yeah, where, where... Huh? Entitlement, exactly. There's a, there's a sense of entitlement in our society, and I think it's becoming so much greater to the point where this generation has a sense of entitlement that almost doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. Like, who gave you the entitlement right? I mean, I would even change right to entitlement. Imagine the, the, the entitlement of free speech. I mean, I, 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 stop talking about that word, that word entitlement. Nobody likes that word entitlement. But that's what rights are. They're entitlements. Well, you know the big problem with rights is that they, they become... They become something that you can assert anytime you have any desire. So it's the one I have. And they're arbitrary. To play video games 18 hours a day. Exactly. And there are, and they're also arbitrary. I can, I can, I can associate any right with anything that makes sense. To any desire. And 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 who? The funny thing is that so it makes sense to me. But who said that what makes sense to me right now is the right thing? Ultimately, yeah. So. If we put it back on the person as it is your responsibility, it's your duty. And what is your duty? It's too hard to say, oh, well, I want you to change your life. And I want you to, to you, know, you know, we spoke about uh, first order change for second order change. I want you to have real second order change in your life. That's too difficult. But if I, but if I say to you, second order change is too difficult. I know that. I know that you're not happy with what's going on in your life right now. I know you'd like to live a more fulfilled, a better, a more enriched life. I know that. So I'm telling you something so simple, which is so profound. You have garments. They're called the garments of your soul. And your soul's garments, which are thought, speech, and action, if you just hone them, if you just take a little more control of them today than you did yesterday, you will have the secret sauce to change in your life. You will have the secret recipe to change in your life. It's that simple. Well, it's not so simple, but it's at least that recipe. And that's simple Simple just doesn't mean easy. Yes. Very good. It's that simple. Maybe not that easy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now let's go back to action. I think that this shows the importance of action. There's, a, there's a, an old Kabbalistic saying that says, think little, speak even less, and do more. It's important to think and speak, but it's most important to act. The, the, the Hasidic adage is ha'amaisa hu a'iker. The action is the main thing. That's really what it's all about. It's all about doing. And at the end of the day, when it comes to thought and it comes to speech, these are all really important things. And the truth is, and we said before, that thought is going to create and thought is going to be the basis of all this. But it is the action that is really going to be the most important thing. And, and, and we'll see, we can see that throughout Jewish history, that there are a lot of people who said things, and those things were not taken to such a, a strength, right? Think about the difference when, when God says to Moses to speak to the rock, and he hits the rock. Well, that's a negative action versus a positive speech, right? And it ends up becoming, it was supposed to be a, 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 a you know, somewhat of a, a negative speech and a positive action. But it ended up becoming a positive speech and a negative action. Without going into the depths of the Kabbalistic elements of Moses hitting the rock. 
what ends up happening is that by it becoming a negative action, it will have a ramification that is beyond the level that Moses can even handle to the point where God says you can't go to the promised land. If you want to go to the promised land in your life, if you want to reach that element of promised land, you can only do it through positive action. The main thing, the essence, the point of all is action. What you're doing, the fact that you're here today, you voted with your feet. Or if you're online, you voted with your fingers. You had to press the button to be able to, to hear. Even if you're scrolling through your Facebook feed and you saw this, you still, you could see my face, but it doesn't mean you're gonna actually join our class. You have to press the button. It's not the power of speech. If you see all the greatest things in your life, you go back to all those greatest things in your life, you're gonna see it's always about the action. It's always about what you're doing. I always think about it and I speak about it so much because I believe that it's such a powerful example of, of the power of action. And I'm sorry if I've said it before and that you've heard it, but I, maybe I'll add another component to it today. The only time that, the, I, that ISIS existed before ISIS was a little over a thousand years ago. They were called the Almohads. There was radical Muslims. And these people were ruthless. In general, for the Jewish people, we were always good under the Muslim countries. I mean, we always lived in, 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 in happiness and in, 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 in peace under the Muslim countries. And what ended up happening is at some point there was a radical Almohad. Actually, ISIS, their playbook is the Almohad playbook. Everything they do is exactly the Almohads, creating the, the Islamic State, Always, had, they wanted to create an Islamic state, and they started off uh, in Spain, and they worked their way down through northern Africa. They pushed people into Egypt, and the Jews had to flee. The Jews at that time they fled, and a lot of the Moroccan Jews today ended up getting to Morocco originally because of the Almohads. They were originally Spanish Jews. They had to flee through northern Africa in order to get to Morocco. As an example, there was a great debate amongst the rabbis as to what to do with the radical Amahads. There are three mitzvot, there are three commandments of which if it comes to a point where you are forced to do these things, you must give up your life, you must sanctify your life for the name of God rather than do them. And that they are idolatry, adultery, and murder. Yeah, but they're more complicated than that. Like, like no, if somebody comes to you... No, even adultery, it's different if it's a goyim or if it's a Jew. Okay, I'm not, go, I'm not going into the, to, to the details no, of it. No, but I'm just saying, like, we say these things, but actually... Not, not, it's, it, you, you'd be surprised. Even, they, said, they, they said a response, even if, like, let's say you're so scared for your life and you accepted of, of what is yeah, there, yeah. then if you're scared for your life, it's okay. Like... So, what, what, it came to the rabbis of the time. And the rabbis of the time were worried about what was gonna be. So people said, I wanna know. When the Almohads come to me and they put a sword to my neck and they say, say Allah is God and Muhammad is the prophet, do I die? Mm -hmm. Is that idolatry? And today, I mean, it's obvious to us because you know, we know that Islam is, 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 is monotheism. I'm not sure why there was a conversation. I would, if I had to speculate, I would say the average Jew at that time was illiterate. Mm -hmm. And they really depended a lot on the rabbis to be able to decide various elements of their life. I'm sorry to, to you, I'm, 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 I am washing it and painting it with a, with, with a brush, but I, I do think that by and large, there was a certain illiteracy at that time. And they come to the leading rabbis of the time. And the leading rabbis of the time say to them, there was actually a letter that was put out saying, that if the radical Amalekites put a sword to your neck, you must die sanctifying the name of God. It's one of the three mitzvot of which we sanctify the name of God. You must do that. There was a young rabbi. He was fairly unknown. 
And he wrote a letter which I believe, and, I, and I, I've said this before, but I will. At some point, I'm going to bring this letter to our, to our class, and we are going to study this letter because I believe it is the most powerful, most incredible letter. It's called Igeret HaAshmad, the Epistle of Martyrdom. I think it's the greatest letter that was ever written. And this young rabbi, who was relatively unknown, basically said the following. Hamaasehu a'ikir. The main thing is action. So therefore, it is true that idolatry is one of the three mitzvot that a person has to give up their life, but they are not asking you to do anything. They're just asking you to say something. And because the main thing is action, when the crusaders came and said, bow down to the cross, bowing down is an action. So bowing down would be idolatry in that level. But whether or not Islam is idolatry, that doesn't matter. All they're asking you to do is use your power of speech. Speech is not action. And because of that, there are people who are dying for absolutely no reason. They think they're sanctifying the name of God. They're not. And people should stop doing it. Just tell them that Allah is God and Muhammad is a prophet and move on. It was insane. People were burning his books in the street, this young rabbi. But this young rabbi was the great Moses Maimonides. And this was, I would say, the first time that, that the Rambam was really catapulted to the scene of the Jewish world. And he himself had to flee. He was part of the same thing. He fled Spain, he ended up going to Egypt, and later into Morocco, like many of the other Jews of his time. So he himself had the same problem, and he spent most of his life on the run as many of the Jews of his time. Yet I think that what Maimonides did in that letter is he showed exactly what it means, to how important, how valuable is the power of action. Yeah, but is it Tzmasya Iker? It's the top J Iker, you know? Okay, so now, now let's understand this. You're asking a very powerful question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to explain the question. Is it, we, didn't we say that thoughts are the main thing? So is it, is it Hamasa Hua Iker? Is it action is the main thing or is it thought that's the main thing so uh, here is no. here is where we have a, 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 an issue so thoughts definitely are part of the creative process there's no question thoughts create but it's action that lives it's action that becomes the essence so shouldn't we be worried if someone would say if somebody came to me and said, I'm busy, I don't have time. Rabbi, your ideas are so good and I do want to live a better life and I do want to become greater and, I, and I'm reading every self-help book I can get my hands on because you know this is what I'm doing. But at the end of the day, I'm reading all the books but I don't have time to do anything, which doesn't make any sense anyway, but okay. <laughs> Why are you reading all the books if you can't do anything? But what would I say? I would say focus on action first. For sure. If there's somebody you trust that's telling you what the correct action is, because that's right. Even if there's someone you don't trust, the purpose of because you action, innately right? you innately have your understanding of what is what is real action. So I don't know if you, even even if there's someone you don't trust. Yeah, but sometimes sometimes you're you're in patterns where you're at, you notice that your actions are leading you down like a path to nowhere, right? You, True. You, you, you notice that, right? Right. And then you're going. Like, you're, you're going the wrong way down the right. You're going the the, the right the wrong way down the. the uh, you're you're get, get down the right road. Fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> getting to nowhere fast. Right? Exactly. And then it's like it's like okay, I need myself some new actions here. Like I need a new battery. So that's when you you scale back to the world of thought and say, okay, like hmm, I'm going to listen to this person. I'm going to listen to this. Person. Like, what is the correct way to go? Right. Right. Now, if you clearly have somebody, let's say, right, in the self-help category, right, that's right. positive psychology or I want to become rich, whatever, and you see somebody who's like, look, I'm going to give you the seven steps to becoming wealthy, okay? Yeah, exactly. And they've done it. Okay, in that sense, like, it doesn't need to make sense to me. I'll just follow what this, uh, this master is, is saying. That these are the correct steps. Just do it. And that's where what you're saying is correct. Like, sometimes, like, don't even go through thought because your thought is unreliable. And just focus on Nasev and Ishma, right? It's like, when you can trust... Great example. Yeah. Do and then ask questions. Do and ask questions. That's the Jewish yeah. way. Or, or it's like when you're in school. 
like you're in school and you're learning certain things. And it's like, why? Well, look, if I have to explain to you the why of every single detail, we're going to be here forever. And forever. Exactly. No, just trust me, do this, do this, do that. You're taking it, shortcuts, you're, you're going to get there. Exactly. But ultimately, for it to become that, it has to penetrate the world of thought as well. It has to become part of your thought. But, but through correct action, you can also discipline your thoughts also as well. It, it, it goes in all directions, right? So. Alana, what are you saying? I want to go back to kneeling before the cross. Okay. So you're doing the action because you have no choice. Well, you do have a choice. You always have a choice. Yeah. The there's choice. always there's a choice. choice. There's always a choice, but your choice is do the action or be killed. That's right. But in your heart, in your thoughts, you know, you are only doing it to save your life. So your intention. So you're saying, what's the difference between action and intention? Yes. yes. Uh, see, there we're opening up a whole other amazing, amazing world of Jewish philosophy and theology. Right, because people it's, said that. People were like, oh, no, we, right. we're, we're really Jewish. According, we're just, uh, according to right. most opinions, what is, the, what is the most, what is the, 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 the greatest prayer of the year? The most attended prayer of the year. What is the most attended prayer of the year? Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre. What is it? What is Kol Nidre? All of my oaths and vows. Really? Really? If you get all the Jews together for one night in the synagogue, would, I could think of so many better prayers than oaths to be able to be like the pivotal prayer. You're opening up Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year with a prayer about oaths and it's this whole yeah. event yeah. and this and the ring of the Torahs and the Chazan is in the middle and with this beautiful melodies and there's some beautiful melodies attached to it and Chazanim, I mean it's literally one paragraph but it takes three hours. What, what's, why, why, why? Why oaths? Why vows? According to most opinions. Taking a chat. Hi. Hi. Yeah. We're in the middle of a class. I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah. According. You, acor can you can join us if you want. Come, come, come. Come in. Okay. Happy lunch break. I'll see you. I'll come Saturday morning. Great. Good to see you. Bye, Rabbi. Why, why are vows so important? According to many opinions, it, were, it was the Muranos that actually wrote the Kol Nidre. Or somebody like the Muranos. Where, could you imagine this? They took an oath. They had no choice. Right. They took an oath. They converted to Catholicism or they, whatever they did, they converted yeah. to some other religion. And a whole year they lived as a lie. And once a year, just imagine this scene on the night of Yom Kippur, they got together and the first thing they said is, God, we're sorry. All of the oaths, all those things I say the whole year that I'm, I'm really a Jew, I'm really yours, but I have no choice in order for me to live. And they, with the soul, with the innermost elements of their heart and soul, they pour it out to God in a way that they've never done before, with the ring of the Torahs, with the melodies. They say, God, this is the real me. This is really who I am. That's why it's so powerful. So intention is a funny thing. Mm -hmm. But think about the Murano and what their intention is. And think about what their action is. So what do we do? Do we say that they're right? It's a great, it's a great controversy, by the way. I'm not saying that the Muranos, what they did, were right or wrong. Right. It, it's, it's still one of the greatest controversies in Jewish theology. Whether or not you falsely convert to Catholicism in a time when you have no choice in order to save your life, or you yeah. don't. And there are people who will tell you equally both sides of the story. And, and, and they're both right, and they both have... Very, very good reasoning for both sides of the, uh, of the coin. So if we go back, and this is where it gets complicated. If we say a Maisa Ueger, well, 
action is everything. You know what we think about it. You know what our thoughts are about the Muranos. But the truth is that my humanity would think the exact opposite of that. My humanity would tell me that intention is the main thing. And the fact that they came to the Kol Nidre and they said to God, here I am. It's, it, I, I, what I'm telling you, I don't have an answer for it. Right. I'm just telling you, it's, there, it's is a, there is a great, great debate. I mean, on a, without, I'm going to take it down a notch. There was a, a chassid who, uh, who was a businessman. And he used to, every so often, he would travel to his Rebbe. I believe it was the Rebbe Rashab. Uh, and he would travel to his Rebbe, uh, like around Rosh Hashanah time. So he comes to the Rebbe Rashab every year. But the whole year, he wore a beautiful suit because uh, he was in business. And when he would go to his Rebbe, he would put on the long coat and he would put on the Hasidic garb. One year, he's on his way to his Rebbe. He's all excited. He's going to go to, to, to Lubavitch, to, to where his Rebbe is. And... He says, what am I fooling my teacher? He's my master. He's my mentor. Why am I fooling? The whole year I wear a suit. Now I'm going to put on and I'm going to pretend like I'm like this holy chassid. I'm not a holy chassid. I'm a businessman. I'm going to go with my suit. He walks in with his suit on. And the rabbi looks at him and says, what's going on? What happened? He said, Rebbe, Rebbe, I don't want to be a liar. A whole year I wear a suit. I'm not, I don't wear the long coat. I'm not going to come to you. So I don't want to fool you. The Rebbe smiles and says, Oh, I thought the whole year you were fooling them. So there is a power in intention. I'm not saying that intention is not a good thing and that it's not important. No, but there's, there's a way also to reconcile this Without getting into the issue of of, uh, of, of death, of, yeah. like, of dying, like instead of doing idolatry, it's that th there may be like circumstances where um, expressing certain things in the world of action is not possible. Right. Okay? I, I think when I, I, I hear this, like like like, so having it in the, in the world of thought, let's say, is kind of like your last your last refuge in a sense, because I, I'm thinking of Viktor Frankl. In the uh, perfect in the, example, you know, and he's like, "Look, you know, you can be even in the middle of a concentration camp, but the last cause of COVID, like, you know, human beings' last freedom goes our last freedom, right? Is, People would give away yeah. their piece of bread, <laughs> yeah. the only thing they had, they give it away to someone else just to be able to have that last bit of freedom. That's right, and it's it's, it's a powerful thing, and, and as a as it's a social world. psychologist, he couldn't believe the concentration. And, imagine and it expresses itself like like Viktor Frankl's. Uh, conception of meaning yeah. expresses itself in the world of thought. It's in the world of thought, one hundred percent. Yeah, you're right. It's, but but it does. But it but it does end up in the world of action. Yeah, in the end, sure, right. It's but how many action. people? But here's a here's a great well, question. Sometimes you're in the world of action. Here's a great prisoner. question. How many people spend time thinking? Of, how many people thought about giving away their bread and didn't do it? That's also interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know that because I don't know their thoughts. And Viktor Frankl can't know that either. Mm -hmm. But how many people in the concentration camp had the good intention of giving away their but they didn't? So tell me, what's more important? I'm gonna, mm -hmm. except using concentration camp examples are very difficult. Mm -hmm. The fact that even people had a thought of giving away their bread is a beautiful thing. Exactly. So, yeah. so let's just call it what it is. You know what? Let's call it what it is. Yeah, but the fact of the matter is, there are people who actually acted on it. And the, definitely there's no question the action is so much greater. But I'm not belittling the intention. Thought is definitely the, the, the basis of the creative process. But the action, you can think and think and think and it's a beautiful thing. And your intentions are wonderful and beautiful and just and amazing and God should give you and bless you with lots of intentions. But what you do is so much more powerful. And it's going to last. And the, Victor Frankl is not talking in his book about the people who had intention to give away bread. No. He's talking about the people, who, the people who did it. And that I think is... And I'm not belittling the people who have the intention. God should bless them and they should, they should live in paradise for all eternity. Because it was really a question of life and death. It was a question of life and death. And even if you had that thought, I think it's a tremendous power because we are using a concentration camp story. 
But the fact of the matter is, is that we see clearly, even in the Viktor Frankl story, how powerful is the action. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah, the, the, the action can give you meaning, and, and in, in Viktor Frankl's system, um, he calls it attitudinal freedom. That's right. Your attitude towards something. So that, that, that would be like more... Attitudinal like freedom, thought. exactly. But, and going back to like um, the, the idea of freedom, this, this very, very complicated idea of freedom, there's a, a great modern thinker, I believe, Jocko Willink. I, I, I told you about this. I know, before. you like Jocko. He's got, he's got this, this, uh, this book called um, uh, Discipline is Freedom. Okay? Because we are, it's true, as a society, we're into this idea of, of freedom as a right. So I have the right to, let's say, do whatever I want. Okay? So that's fine. So there's no external constraints. There's no state apparatus or church uh, dictating that you should do this or you should do that. So you have right. freedom to do anything. Beautiful. Okay, but then then what? Right. So he said, then in order to actually do anything at all of any worth, you need to have discipline. Without discipline, responsibility. And yeah, that goes that, back that, to that responsibility. To and that responsibility. goes back to the fact that we call these the yeah. garments of the soul, the thought, speech, and action that go back to the responsibility, not the right. And then exactly, we need the discipline. Because otherwise, and, you actually don't have the freedom to do anything at all. So if we focus on essence... In a sense, right? In a deep sense, you don't yeah. have the freedom to do it. If we focus on essence and we focus on all these things, I want to become a better person, I want to make a, my mark in the world, etc., 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 we're missing the point. What we're saying here, and if I had to sum up our entire class into a few words, it would be the following. You want to start changing your life? Thought speech and action. Focus on those. Don't focus on vague ideas that may or may not make the world a better place. Focus on action first, then speech, then thought. And thought being the most powerful because it is the closest thing we have to the creative process. That is the basic summary of our class today. Thoughts? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>